everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is Hangout number 111. Uh, okay, I'm trying to calm down. Welcome everybody who's in the chat room. Um, I've already greeted most of you. If you're coming in now, welcome. Um, if you'd like to be in the chat room, please do clink, clink, <laughs> click the link below. And uh, that says Patreon. And for five bucks a month, you can join in all the chat rooms and be at all the lives, which are eight of them. Um, if you're not into doing that, please support the channel by subscribing. Really, subscribing makes a huge difference and doesn't cost you anything. Subscribe, like, and check my playlist for all the stuff I've done uh, to see if you've, I've already covered what you're interested in and you're always free to send in suggestions. Now, uh, let me say one more hello to everybody. Okay, so... <laughs> So let's make fun of Pat Brown. Clinkity clink. I have, I have just, um, uh, I have just, hi, Sarah um, and Florence. Um, yes, I just put up, in case you haven't seen it, because I just put it up, I just put up my third video on Joran van der Sloot and his plea deal. I read more about what was going on, and, um, and it made me even more angry than I had been before. Uh, because, oh, I just see... You know, it's not just Jordan Vandersloot, in case you don't know who that creep is. There he is, the one who killed Natalie Holloway. And also, um, see, now here's a sad thing. I have trouble remembering the other girl's name, Flores, uh, Stephanie Flores down in Peru. She also suffered a brutal murder, but, you know, she's sort of forgotten in the whole mix of things because, you know, I'm living in an English speaking country generally. Yeah, maybe some Spanish, but, um, you know, it's not South America. So over there, maybe her crime has been more reported and, and, and Vandersloot is in a Peruvian prison. So, but we don't, we don't even speak about it much here because the focus is on Natalie Holloway because we've been through that whole, the whole story for so long with uh, Joran Vandersloot lying and doing all the conniving things he's doing. Um, but what bothers me so much and what I did in this video, I'm not going to repeat the video here. Just I'll link it below, go and watch it is that Joran van der Sloot is a psychopath. You can expect him to be a lying POS. You can expect that. But I also expect the, the experts around that POS <laughs> to be able to help guide uh, the families of victims to understand what they're dealing with and to not sugarcoat it and say, oh, well, if, if you feel that way, it's okay. Let's do a plea deal, make you happy. I don't know what the, the stuff that I think the FBI did to get this plea deal, the prosecutors did to get this plea deal was repulsive. And Beth thinks Beth Calloway now thinks at least she's got some closure. And I'm going to guarantee you watch my video. She's not because Joran van der Sloot just got a big door open for him. And, and the problem is when you're, when you're a family of a victim, you will fall for pretty much anything anybody says a lot of times because you're, you're so emotional. You need some good people, some people who aren't making money off of you like the media, um, to sit down and help you understand how things really are. But it doesn't seem to work that way. And, and the, the concept of psychopathy is so downplayed. I mean, we talk about it like, oh, oh yeah, psycho, he's a psychopath. And oh, well, no all that, but we don't seem to actually understand it as what it really is. And so uh, just to start off on the show, I'm going to show you a couple things a psychopath said. And I, he claims to be a psychopath. He says he's been diagnosed as one. And of course, he's on the, on the internet. So it might be, so you don't know if he's a guy lying to get attention, which could make him a psychopath. Or he's a psychopath not lying to get attention, which is still make him a psychopath. You see how that works? But let me show you a couple things this guy said, which I thought were kind of right on the money. All right. First one. Somebody asked him, but because he was married, he said, well, why would you get married if you can't be happy with one person? Which he replied to. Now, this is the important part. Read the second line. I care about maintaining the relationship to an extent. I entered into the marriage for stability, financial benefits, sex, and cultural reasons. Because people don't understand why psychopaths would even get married. Why do serial killers get married? Why would Dennis Rader be married? Why? Why? You know, why? Because, first of all, they get regular sex. 
that's a big deal for, to a lot of psychopaths and to many non-psychopaths. It's like, it's real tiring to go always have to get a, try to find another person, a new date, to get a new girlfriend so you can get some sex. I mean, if you have a wife at home, you get sex, theoretically. And, you know, and if you're a psychopath, probably you're going to manipulate her into giving it to you when you want it. Um, so you get sex regularly. Two, a lot of times she offers a cover. If you have issues with what you do, like you like to kill people, um, you want to have a nice cover. Oh, look, I'm a married man. You know, I wouldn't go out raping and murdering women, would I? You know, and still people will say, well, I don't see why the guy's a rapist because he's got a wife at home. You see how people fall for that? So he knows that. So he's like, that's my cover. If I have a wife, couldn't be a rapist. So then he's got her. Maybe she makes money. Maybe she already had the house that he moved into. You know, so he's getting something financially maybe out of that deal as well. Also, maybe he likes to control somebody. Somebody can push around all the time. And he doesn't always have to go out in society and find it. He's got the little pawn right in his house. Having children. People say, well, then why would he have children? To prove he's a man. Oh, look, I can procreate. You know, look, I had sex with my wife. I made babies. And then the little baby is kind of cute. He can go around and show it off like a new toy. And then that little child looks up to him 100% like he's a god. And a psychopath loves that. But, you know, those little critters grow up a little bit more and they start seeing that you're a little tarnished and they go, but daddy. And then that psychopath gets quite annoyed. And his wife is getting, you know, so, so many years have gone by. The wife is now seven years in. She doesn't look as perfect as she did before. She doesn't give him as much sex as he got before. And the kids are getting annoying. And then he meets a stripper and he thinks, that looks better. So he kills the family and goes off with a stripper. And people go, well, how could he have done that? He, he appeared he loved his wife and children. No, he didn't. Let's read what the guy says. I care about maintaining the relationship to an extent. I entered into the marriage for stability, financial benefits, sex, and cultural reasons. That's truth. Now let's look at one other thing the guy said. Um, the self-professed psychopath says, I've wronged a lot of people over the course of my life. I do not experience guilt or remorse. My actions typically do not warrant a second thought. Absolutely. Joran van der Sloot could give a crap that he killed Natalie Holloway. And my favorite line from a serial killer, uh, who I always forget his name, since Canadian dude. Um, but he said, when they said, why don't you tell us where the children were buried? You could then, you know, give the parents some relief. You could help the parents. He said, well, if I cared about the parents, I wouldn't have killed their kids. Touche. So this is true. Um, his the actions don't warrant a second thought. I have, however, experienced regret, especially if certain actions haven't led to have led to poor outcomes. That's all they care about. Did it work for me or didn't it work for me? This is why Dr. Stanton Samenow, when he was working with psychopaths, said, look, you can't fix them. All you can do is teach them that what they're doing is detrimental to them. They don't care about other people. Now, let's teach you how detrimental it is to other human beings. Let's teach you sympathy and remorse. And No, no, they don't give a crap. They don't care about other human beings. But you can teach them, dude, this is not working for you. Because if you do this, this is going to happen to you. That's the only way you can change their behavior, but only by reaching out to their nasty little narcissistic selves. So understanding psychopaths is very important. Jordan van der Sloot is a massive psychopath. He didn't take the plea deal to because he cared about Beth Holloway. He 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 said he gets showed quote remorse. I'm so sorry I did this to you, and I found God. <laughs> yeah, sure. What a lying piece of crap. And if anybody believes that, anybody believes that it's sad. And to allow him to even open his little trap and say that makes you just want to punch him in the face because. It served no purpose. His story served no purpose and his lies to serve no purpose. His, his apology served no purpose. It's just a charade or a charade, depending on where you come from. Because that's the way psychopaths work. Understand that. And, and, and I don't think people understand psychopathy enough. I am, I am eventually going to do a whole series on psychopaths and psychopathy because I just want this to be much more understood and too often I think it's downplayed in some strange fashion. It's downplayed almost where people have sympathy for a psychopath. Well, when you're standing there in the forest 
And you say, you know, I sympathize with your problem. He goes, I'm hungry and it kills you. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to sympathize very long. Okay. That's my opening on why I'm not doing the whole thing on your own Vanderslope. Uh, Oh, did, oh, <laughs> Sandra says, Chris Watts said he found God. Yeah, it's amazing where they all find God. It's right in that prison. <sighs> ah. uh, real talk with Pat Brown. You know, I try. I do try. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Clarissa says, we are doing exactly what he wants to talk about him. In my video, what I'm talking about is what's going to happen in the future. Now that he has been allowed to confess to the murder because he won't take because because there's no repercussions. Now he can always talk about the murder. To whom? Hello, Netflix. Hello, Netflix. Oh, Lord. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, um, oh, that's a good point. Alyssa says, I think psychopaths find God because it lets them believe they're justified or lets them just save face. Both, the, both of the things are true. Uh, there's, there's a number of psychopaths who also go to church a lot. And this is you, church ladies. We got to pay attention to this. They pick churches to go to because they can blend in there. People will accept them in spite of themselves. So they act like they're a little weird or a little this or a little that had a bad background. No church people are supposed to accept you, you know, as you are come as you are, because we're here to, to help you understand God loves you. And then what's in that church are nice, naive women. And that's who the psychopath preys on. He looks for himself a church lady that he can take advantage of because that's what they do. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you can't teach, teach a fish to climb a tree. That is, yes. See, what you are is what you are. Now, um, when, when you're not, um, make a deal with the devil. Yes, they did make a deal with the devil. And that really, 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 really upset me uh, because he is a devil and it's, it's not going to be, become an undevil, but we are supposed to know better. We're supposed to not fall for this crap, especially when you're in law enforcement and you're in prosecutions, you're, you're in the justice system, you're a profiler. Why the heck are you, why the heck are you playing this game? You know, are you on his side to give him what he wants? So upsetting. All right. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. I want to, I want to do after I, I just got to get this guy out of my head right now. It's like, Oh, let me show you something. I'm, I'm going to have a pleasant moment. So I went to my art class and I painted, I painted something similar to this snow with some trees and there was actually glowy things over here. And my, my art instructor said, I really love it. Well, for some reason I was bored. So I turned it upside down. I said, Oh, that looks like a reservoir and maybe some snow and I could put some mountains in. So this is not the original picture, obviously, because I covered it up. So, 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 so that that picture in the snow turned into this. I'm not sure how it turned into this, but it turned into some mountain with a palm. My teacher hated it, but you know that's the way it goes. So I'm, I'm trying again to give her what she wants. I'm going to make a snow scene, but <laughs> we have to Oregon. That's Oregon. Okay, sure, because there's no picture in front of me, so I just made that crap up. <laughs> anyway, let me get. I just have to have a, a moment of clearing my mind. All right. I want to tell you the story because if, if you listen to any of my dear profiler Pats, one of them uh, that I did recently was um, should I, should I move in with my significant other? In other words, a boyfriend, somebody you, you've, you've become involved with and they want you to move to, into their life. And I call it installing. Now, mind you, that can be a male, a female moving into a male's life or male moving into a female's life, females to females, males to males, I don't care. The significant other, the question is, how equal is it? How much is, you know, he, he or she is getting what they want and you're down here and you're supposed to just accept whatever they want and give up everything you have. And I gave some examples, but I just read this in Dear Abby. And I thought, wow, this is really a good one. Okay, so here's Dear Abby. And I just think this is really shows. And this is talking about not necessarily psychopaths, but certain levels of narcissism that you might not recognize in a significant other that will affect you forever. Listen to this. Dear Abby, I've been separated and divorced for two years. A year ago, I met a man through a mutual friend. He was also going through a divorce. Okay, right here, we got problems. 
When you're just divorcing, you shouldn't be hooking up with people. You need you need to have time away from the divorce to <coughs> hold on a second. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Something in my throat. <coughs> hold on. Um, um, uh, you need time away. First of all, you shouldn't be in the process of a divorce. Your divorce should be finalized. You should be an actual single person. If you're not divorced, you're still married. I don't approve of anybody still married. I don't care if you're in the process, separated, whatever, because there's always a chance you get back together. If there's children involved, it's just not right. Make sure you have a full divorce. You're done with the relationship and you had a couple years before you even meet anybody after the full divorce is done. That's my opinion. But she said, so she's um, a year after her divorce. Um, uh, she said she, start, uh, they, she started communicating with this person fell in love and have been traveling back and forth between Ohio where he works and New Jersey where I am. So we're starting with already a long distance relationship. Not a great idea. He wants me to quit my job and find a new one so we can make our relationship permanent in Ohio. I'm a sales support coordinator for a broker and I've been with a company for some time. There's no guarantee I could find a job that pays as well as this one does. He has his own business and also cares for his elderly aunt and uncle. Holy God, I see what's happening. You just become a domestic servant. You're supposed to give up your entire life in New Jersey. Is it New Jersey? Yeah. Your job that you had a long time that gives you security. You're supposed to toss all that away. Move to be with this guy who it seems to me like you don't know him that well. And you're going to move into his house, his house, not your house, his house. And you don't have a job, so you can be taking care of his aunt and uncle. <laughs> that dude is good. That dude's like thinking, yeah. I want to be with him, but at my age, 60, I'm hesitant to start a new job. Also, I'd be leaving my adult kids behind and would miss them dearly. Yeah, ex exactly. You're supposed to give up your family to go live far, far away, so you hardly ever see your children, so you can see his aunt and uncle 24 hours a day. It's a dilemma because I want to be able to see my kids as often as I can, but I also love this man and I want to share my life with them. How do I figure this out? If you've been living in two very separate places, you have no idea what this guy is like. Zero. Because distance things always give you that time not to be stuck with them and get annoyed by them. You have no idea what he's like. You should not be giving up your life to take that kind of a horrific risk. Now, maybe if you had nothing to lose, yeah, that's what I said in my video. Maybe if you had nothing to lose. Let's say you're living in a shabby apartment. You hate your job. You have one kid and the kid lives in Tokyo. And you, you hate the town you live in. Eh, all right, so what? You're not going to lose anything. Take a, take, take a jump. But you got all this and you're going to go jump into this man's life. You've never lived with him. You don't know if he's a creepo. You don't know all his issues. You're just going to go there and you're going to become a domestic servant? Are you out of your damn mind? <laughs> um. I do appreciate, sometimes I really don't like some of the answers I see from dear Abby or dear Amy or whoever, but this one was good. She, she said, uh, um, what did dear Abby say? Your work is cut out for you. Well, maybe I don't like this one. Let me think. Before making any decisions, do some exploring. Would moving out of state guarantee that you'd be able to sacrifice your well-paying job? Many people work remotely these days. It wouldn't hurt to ask if it would be possible for you to do that with your current company. Are there similar job openings where your gentleman friend lives? Relocating to Ohio would not necessarily mean you would no longer see your adult children. Oh, yes, it does. Uh, they would, they could visit, and the reverse is always true, but har hardly ever because everybody's busy and it's quite a distance. Other families surmount this challenge. Give yourself some time to decide what is right. Okay, I don't like her answer. <laughs> Sorry, dear Abby. Why didn't she say that guy should move to freaking New Jersey? Why does she have to give up everything to be with this character? Why? So that, that's what always drives me crazy. It's like, well, she's, how is she supposed to even figure out whether it's worth it? Because she didn't even know the guy well enough. She hasn't lived with him. She has never lived with him. She has a long distance relationship. It's nonsense. But you see how that works? Mm. Then when she gets over there and finds out she's in a one-sided relationship, hello. All right. Oh, there's a good point, Tracy. I also noticed she mentioned she goes to see him all the time. But I don't hear him coming to see her. There you go. 
He's less invested in a relationship than she is, yet she still wants to live with him. Right, because he doesn't have to give up anything. Hey, you want to show up? You can live in my house. And if it doesn't work out, I'll kick you out of my house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Now, and, and that, and that um, yeah, I think so, too. It was bad advice. I was trying to be nice. I was going to say it was going to be good advice. But, um, oh, that's a sweet way of looking at it. Brian Blessed said, you have to really love yourself. To love oneself is to have a lifelong romance. That's really nice. Yeah, that's really nice. But be sure to take yourself out to really nice places. <laughs> if you're going to date yourself, be sure you have go out to great restaurants, great theater, great vacations. <laughs> Try not to bore yourself. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> He could be obese, and we know what Pet thinks about that. No, 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 you're wrong, Sarah. Obesity to me is unhealthy, and it's not terribly attractive because I've been there, and now I'm barely, barely out of 20, uh, 20 pounds out of obese and into, into just fat. But I've always said I would marry a man who is obese, in a wheelchair, blind, deaf, if that man were I don't know if I'd marry because I'm too, I'm, I'm, I don't even waste my time in marriage, but I would have a partner who was any of those things. If he were a great, great companion, a great partner who made me laugh every morning, I'll push that stupid wheelchair around. I don't care because if he's that much enjoyable to be with, I can live with that. And obesity, it may not be attractive. It may be unhealthy, but if he's the greatest person in the world that I've ever been around, I can live with it. So, but the, the real question is, what kind of true relationship do you have with the other person? Or are they just using you and you, you're the one who has to give the 90% and they're giving 10 because they don't have, they don't feel a need to do more than that. And that's important. Now, I want to go to the, the, the this case, which was brought to me. I think it was Benny who brought this to me. This is the guy who drowned his wife in a bathtub. He just got convicted today. Um, let me find it. Hopefully I won't lose my pictures. Last time, remember, I clicked on one picture and the entire iPad screen just vanished. So upsetting. All right. So let's see. Where is it? Um, all right. It is. Um, what's his name? Oh, Tranis. I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that, how to pronounce his name. But um, his wife's name was Shanti. That I can pronounce. Um, but his name was. Let me let me t show you this creature. Um, oh, oh, where are you, buddy? Where are you? I've lost him. No, no, we're not going to do that. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> there he is. David. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Okay. Just David on the left. He's on trial for first degree murder of his wife, Shanti Cooper Thrones. Uh, he killed, he, she was, she died in 2018. And this guy, I, I do believe he got convicted today. Um, <laughs> she, she, let me tell you some story about so about this. First of all, let me tell you how she died. This is from the autopsy. The victim was hit with such force she had two fractures to her skull. Her hyoid bone was in her throat was broken. Her ear was pulled to the point of being almost torn off. Blood was found in her bed, but he claimed she drowned. He, he claimed they were together, and then he went out to walk the dog, and when he came back, she was dead. And um, then he called immediately. Well, he's got the, the, the really stupid stupid story where he's like oh and i tried to get her out of the bathtub because she must have slipped and fallen in the bathtub and it he's like just so she could barely get out of the bathtub and he moves her all around the house and tries to revive her but he never actually properly revised her in any way shape or form that looks like cpr and then he calls and they people the the police come emergency services and she's dry <laughs> like she's really dry <laughs> if you just pull her out of the bathtub shouldn't she be like soaking wet but so anyway, all the evidence pointed to the fact that she was actually killed way earlier uh, in, her, in the bed. And obviously, you don't fall in the bathtub and end up with a broken hyoid bone and a smashed up head. <laughs> Just nonsense. One of the worst fake stories I've ever heard. You're on Take 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 that into my... Oh, no, you did the cinder block deal, even though there's no cinder blocks on a beach. You haven't explained where the heck you took her off to to find a cinder block, but all right. You know, you're drunk with a girl, you walk out at the bar, you walk down to the beach, you're sitting on the beach canoodling, and suddenly you have a cinder block in your hand. Well, this guy has the stupidest story ever. So anyway, um, the, but the, what's interesting about it was this, uh, and let me, let me see if I can find it here. Um, it was the issue of how she got hooked up with this guy. 
And it's just so sad. Um, hold on a second. Let me see if I can find the, the one I put up here. Uh, okay. He lied about being a millionaire. So they met on match.com. You see how that works. And he apparently said he was a millionaire. Now he had been married to some a woman who apparently kind of maybe involved in this whole thing too, in some way, shape or form. But very soon after, let me see if I can find how quickly after, and this is where I'm talking about that time frame. All right, let me find it. Um, uh, she was thinking of leaving her husband because, uh, because he's a big fat lying dog and a psychopath, right? But um, what happened was they met on match.com. Uh, yeah, here we go. And he allegedly told her he inherited $4 million to $6 million from his father. The claim was later found to be untrue. <laughs> you know, when I met my husband, who my ex-husband, he was 19, I was 23. We met um, in a music store and we date, went out on a date. The first thing I said to him, because he's from Jamaica, I said, show me your green card. No, I was 23 years old. I wasn't a dumb crap back then. I'm like, show me your green card. Because I don't want to date you if you don't have a green card. Because I'll think you're dating me to get a green card. And he showed me his green card. I went, okay, you get a second date. You tell me you got $6 million? Uh, you're on Match.com. I'm a rich dude. I got $6 million. Show me the evidence. Okay, I'm not going to hook up with you permanently. Have you move into my life? Because he did. He, let's see, how would have happened there? Um, after they hooked up, it was like very shortly after he moved down to where she lived into her home. Um, and that's not the right article I had on that. I'm trying to find the one that says the, the trajectory. Um, okay, here we go. He moves to Florida. All right. So his name is Dave. All right. So let's see. Um, they met on match.com in 2013. Then let's see months. The word is important. Months later, Dave moved from Minnesota to Orlando to be with Shanti and her young son. And I have a problem right now. And this is what upsets me greatly. You have a young son. You meet some creep on match.com and he moves into your house with the young son. That should never have happened. He should have moved into an apartment. He should have rented a place for two years nearby where you could get to know him. But no, he moved straight into your dang house. Then in April of 2015, so he's been hanging around with her for, let's see, let's see. Yeah, okay. Uh, in 2015, it's like two years later, he buys a house, bought a home for $600,000. It was like a money pit. It was like something you renovate. And he guess whose money ended up renovating that house? Her money. Well, wait a minute. Where's your four to six million dollars? Why don't you use that to renovate the house? Matter of fact, why the hell do you even want to renovate a house? You <laughs> four to six million dollars. Buy a damn house. But that's not what happened. So he now uses her money to renovate the house. The couple began renovating the home with Shanti Cooper footing the bill and Dave overseeing the construction. Oh, I'm glad he did something. But then get this. Oh. Then, let's say they bought the house and wait a minute, let me see when they bought the house. Uh, they bought the house in, it's a bad website, it keeps flickering, 2015. Okay, then they get married. Okay, you, you're footing the bill so you know how your, husband, your, your boyfriend's a big fat ass liar. And you marry him anyway. Then you get all upset about the house and he wants to be on some reality show so you know he's a fruitcake. He doesn't want to be on some reality show and you don't want this and blah, blah, blah. And you object, you say you're going to leave him. Oh, and by the way, it turns out he goes to gay, <laughs> gay, gay bathhouses. <laughs> and you say, I think I'm done with this. And he said, well, I'm done with you then. And that's how she got murdered. Unbelievable. Sad, but unbelievable. Yeah, desperately seeking love. Oh, it's a, it is inc incredibly so much of a shame that 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 feeling people get takes your mind and makes it just go go insane. Um, a couple thousand bucks. Is that all? I said she footed the bill, but you know it could be a lie. Uh, but she but currently, um, 
Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I got rid of My husband and I dated for seven years before marrying, and then we found out a year later I could sponsor him. Well, at least you were together a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember. I forgot how my husband got his... He's, he's a, my ex is a citizen, and um, but he was honorable about it. So, no, I was okay about that. Um, let's see. Um, uh, there's somebody who has some really, really lovely thoughts. Um, you know, love can be the best thing, but a fake, fake love can also be incredibly destructive. And I think that. If you really want true love, that person you're going to be with should respect that you want real love. And if they're pushing you into things, that's not real love. That, that's, that's your clue. If you can't say, hey, I have a child in the house. You cannot move into my home at this moment, but I really, really like you. Can you move down the street? If they say no, then you're like, well, I guess it's, it's, you're just trying to use me. That that's your clue. If you go on a date with a person and you won't have sex on the first date and they won't ever see you again, they won't give you the second date. They just want you for sex. They weren't interested in you. Look at the writing is right there on the wall. A person who truly cares will show you they truly care. A person who doesn't truly care, well, they'll show you that too. But you just gotta you just gotta recognize it. Now I had one more. I had a different one too. I don't know why I saw these these today, but I saw another. It was Dear Amy. Okay. Here, I just want to talk a lot about, you know, personality disorders and people falling for them because we see homicide often has to do with people falling for psychopaths, uh, especially in the marriage situation, dating situation. Okay, here, dear Amy, I have been in a relationship for the past eight months with a guy. Two months in, he lost his job and moved in with me and my daughter. Hello, there again. Guy loses his job. You don't let him move into your house. Sorry. You have a daughter. He shouldn't be in your house. You you know, you only known him for two months, eight weeks. You know who this character is. And why did he dang lose his job? Probably because he's the reason you shouldn't have him moving into your house. <laughs> I took care of him and helped him to get a much better job. Well, good for you. I wake up before him and pack his lunches, do his laundry. And cook and clean up after him. <laughs> he had a, he had a very bad drinking problem that would cause him to black out and act very badly. If a person has a drinking problem, severe alcoholism, and if they're even in AA, getting better. Again, my rule here: if somebody is attending AA and they come to you and say, "I'm in AA," you say, "That's good. Have you been sober for two years?" They should be sober for two years. They should have a job in their own place to live. Then you date them. You don't date them when they're two months into AA, don't have a place to live and would like to come into your house. They haven't gotten themselves healthy yet. And a person who hasn't gotten themselves healthy yet, let them take care of themselves first because they cannot take care of you. And if you take care of them, they're never going to get healthy. So no, they have responsibility to them and other human beings not to infringe on them while they're trying to get their act together. Um, he had a very bad drinking problem, which caused him to black out and act very badly. I also found out that he was connecting with other women the whole time. <laughs> okay, so this guy's already cheating on you. How long have you been with a guy? He's already cheating on you. Listen, eventually, he cut all, out all the hard alcohol. Okay, but the soft alcohol, not so much. He would, We would do well for a little while, and then he'd start drinking again and would verbally abuse me and leave me crying. Afterward, I would explain how this was not okay. We broke up about a week ago because he put his hands on me. I asked him to leave and he did. I started to feeling so much better, but of course I missed him like crazy. Cause you know how drunk cheating love is. <laughs> My girlfriends took me out and I met a lawyer, very respectful, very kind. And he seems like a gentleman. He asked me out for coffee. Then my ex sent me a long message begging me to take him back. We talked on the phone for hours about how what he did was wrong and how his life was so much worse without me. <laughs> you know, how much better your life is without him is what you should be looking at. I, we talked on the phone for hours about what he did was wrong, you know, because that always makes a difference. Um, okay. I truly did love him. Although he treated me badly, we had a lot of good times. 
I don't know what to do. What would you do? Well, okay. I'm going to give Amy a thumbs up on this one. Dear Conflicted, please don't ask me what I would do because I can only think of the many things I wouldn't do. Starting with moving an unemployed and angry blackout drinker into my house with a daughter who's also there. Yes. I like when I see other people give advice, whether they be people who are profilers or people who are psychologists or people who I have no idea who the heck they are, give good advice. Problem averted. Uh, your judgment seems to be extremely flawed when it comes to this person. And while you obviously take pride in your martyrdom, <laughs> and another way to see this is to understand that your choice to take the word of a lying abuser over your own experience is extremely risky. Your desire to rescue this man and patiently teach him how to be a decent human being seems to reflect a lack of humility on your part. Ooh. It is as, as if you see yourself as being powerful enough to undo his deep character flaws and many serious problems. And your choice is perhaps take him back reflects your low self-esteem. You might be able to do some deep therapeutic work in order to figure out why you're drawn to the situation. But in the meantime, you, could, you should do only one thing. Decide to protect your daughter from the chaos this man creates in your life. Holy crap. A plus. This is it. Dear Amy. Is this Dear Amy? Dear Amy. I don't know who Dear Amy is actually. <laughs> ask, ask, ask Amy. Amy Dickinson. She's a syndicated columnist. I couldn't have stated it better. That was awesome. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Mm. Give kisses to her. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was great. <laughs> Super great. Ah, yes, that just, that, just, that just made me feel so good after all the Joran van der Sloot crap. Um, you know, it's nice to, nice to see something great like that. Ah, that read was kind of brutal and totally true. Now, you see, this is an interesting thing. I get accused many times. I'm not saying you're doing that, but it is kind of, was kind of brutal. I'm accused many times of being brutal, that I was brutal to, to, um, uh, in the, in the case of Joanna van der Sloot and, and talking about, um, Beth going along with this de plea deal and believing in it. Truth is often brutal, but truth will set you free. And that's what people don't seem to want to understand. They want to be coddled. They want people to go, it's okay. No, it's not okay. Sometimes it's actually not okay. And if you know it's not okay, and you have to then deal with reality that, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I have to, to either fix or, or, or walk away from or build on or whatever it is. This is what it is. All the, all the fake lies and the fake, oh, you know, so let me give you huggy stuff and all that kind of crap that people do to be nice. Because they themselves, they don't want to be looked at as a bad person, a meanie, a meanie bird, you know? They don't want to be mean. So just you just always say nicey things, even when you're hurting the person you're saying them to because you're coddling them and it's not helping them at all. Now, I'm not saying you should always give your crappy little opinion to everybody and, you know, at any time. But this woman asked for Amy's opinion. She gave a proper and very honest, great opinion. Whereas Abby... Abby failed because what she did was go, oh, you know, you just might want to do this. She didn't even really focus on the actual issue, which is, first of all, why are you giving your whole life for a guy you hardly even know? You're an idiot. <laughs> You're an idiot. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, sometimes just got to know the truth. Oh, Lord. Um, no, uh, thank you. I don't think people thought I was brutal about Joran van der Sloot. They thought I was brutal because I was telling Beth Holloway that the plea deal was not correct. That it should never have happened. And that she did not get the truth from Joran van der Sloot. And just because he confessed to the murder, we already knew he murdered her. She already knew he murdered her. So what did it, what did it do for her to hear him say that? Because he's a psychopath. He doesn't care that he murdered her. So he says it. He's just mocking you anyway. He's still telling you the stuff. He's laughing at you because you go, oh, finally, he's confessed. Finally, he's telling the truth. Maybe he does feel remorse. No, he doesn't. He's playing you. And it bugs me that nobody says that. Mm. Okay, I'm back to your own final slot. I'm going to lose my mind. <sighs> okay, let me go to another story. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, there was another one. I want to talk about um, the, the story because, you know, we, we talked about the uh, 
a story about the bathtub dude giving a really bad story. Okay. Then there's this guy. Okay. This guy is, um, he was charged with murdering a model by the name of Linda Sobeck in 1995. And this is Linda Sobeck. Okay. Now, what interested me in this case, let me find Linda Sobeck, was his story. All right. So Linda Sobeck, she was a former Los Angeles Raiders cheerleader, sexually assaulted, strangled, and buried by a, phot by a photographer. All right. The day began like any other. She's 27 years old. She was a model actress and former cheerleader. She called her mother to check in, and she said she booked a photo shoot, and she called later. And then she kind of went missing. Um, and what happened was, let me find, if they searched for her, they couldn't find her. Uh, they looked at her boyfriends, her past boyfriends, and nothing came up. But then they got a call. They got a call from this man who found the fo some photos of her that he thought they were so bad because she'd been, I guess, all over the news. He found, he found the photos of her in, wait a minute, where is this? It was in a roadside trash bin. Um, he had been doing cleanup in the Los Angeles County wilderness area in the National Forest, and he found these, these photos. He said this woman was so beautiful that he was going to keep, <laughs> that's kind of creepy, keep for the photographs. But then he saw reports of the, that this was the missing woman on the news. And he goes, holy crap. So he called, which is pretty brave of him because most people would think that if he actually called with the photos, that he might become a suspect. So I got to give him credit for, it, for being willing to do that. Um, so uh, so he, he reported this to the, the, where he found the, exactly where he found the pictures. Investigators believe more evidence could be found there, tossed in that same location. So they searched the dumpsters. And they found a modeling photograph of Linda and another bag, a daily planner. Uh, the page for November 16th, when she vanished, was ripped out. That's not a good sign. <laughs> and I began, this guy said, I began to believe that Linda was a victim of a homicide. All right. Then they had all the trash they recovered from it. They looked through it. And by the way, trash is really great stuff. Um, when, when, if you don't, if you if you're committing crimes or doing things you shouldn't be doing, or you don't want the paparazzi after you, don't put your trash on the sidewalk, in a, in a big trash bag or in your trash bin. Because once it's on the sidewalk, it's like public property, so you can go up and just pull every, take the trash. So if it's on private property, you can't do that. But if it's in the street, you can do that. And I have done that as a PI in the past. I have pulled trash, and one of the most interesting trash things I pulled um, was that. The, this person who lived there was deaf. Now, today, deaf people, they text, they use, you know, all the same stuff hearing people do. But back in the day, there was a, a t thing called a TTY, which was a, a machine, which you called on. And there was a printout of the conversation. Well, the deaf guy who lived in the house took all the printouts, threw them in the trash. So I had a running log of his entire, what he was saying. On top of that, I also had, I knew exactly what he ate. I know what kind of sex he had. <laughs> I, you know, all this kind of stuff, all from just the trash. So if you're going to commit a crime, just don't put your trash on the sidewalk. But also if you get yourself in a trash bin and somebody gets to it before you, other people, you know, until it's thrown in the trash dump to the point where you can't find it anymore. In there is where people throw away stuff, thinking it will never be seen again. And in this particular case, they found the photos. They found the, the day planner. What else did they find? Um, uh, they also had the canine units there. They sifted through the trap. They found a lease for a Lexus prototype SUV. Um, and let's see. The agreement was dated November 16th. Oh, that's that same day. Between Lexus Corporation and a photographer named Charles Rathbun. They learned that Rathbun had returned the Lexus SUV on November 20th. So they searched. They got to the crime lab and they searched it. Then they brought in Rathbun, who was 38 years old. He explained that he was working on the Sobek. Oh, he told so the guy, I'm working on the Sobek missing person case. Rathbun said he had photographed her two years earlier for a Chevy, a Chevy, a Chevy shoot. Okay, sure. But then he had to admit, okay, I did meet her on November 16th at a Denny's. Uh, he needed to book a model for a Lexus shoot and claimed that he, she, 
she, she wasn't right for the job and he sent her away. But he agreed to come in and make a formal statement. And while he was making the formal statement, he said, I guess it's really important I talk to you considering I was the last person to see her. How do you know that? <laughs> Wouldn't the killer be the last person who saw her? Dumb statement. You're not too bright. So anyway, they never hinted he was the last person to see her. So basically, they're like, hey, okay. So they found Sobek's car in Denny's parking lot where Rath Bunnett said he met her and had been sitting there since the day it was parked. So clearly she disappeared from the Denny's with somebody. The last person who saw her. <laughs> so anyway, they did a surveillance. Um, let's see what else happened to this guy. Then he'd been, oh, he'd been out drinking and telling his close pals he was responsible for her disappearance because he's not too bright. All right, so then the two pals came came uh, came by and he fired a round of a gun at the ground, a ricochet and hit one of them in the arm. <laughs> so now he's been taken into account uh, and for assault with a deadly weapon. The two friends had new information on him. Not that they, but he said, talk to him. Okay, but anyway, it turned out that he, uh, uh Okay, so eventually, Rathburn said he he and Sobek drove the prototype Alexis to the Mojave Desert, where they photographed it. And then, it was about 40 miles from the forest. He then said he wanted to photograph the car doing donuts. But Sobek wasn't getting it right. This is where you blame the victim for what happened. Okay, she got out of the car and had jumped, and he jumped to show her what to do. That's when he claimed he accidentally <laughs> hit her with the car and killed her. And it, then, and then he, thought, he thought about taking her to the hospital. Oh, well, you know, most people do think about taking a person they hit with a car to the hospital. But he decided in his panic not to do so, so he buried her. <laughs> As we all would after we accidentally hit somebody with a car. So he buried her. So he agreed to take the police to the site the burial site. But for six hours, he just led them all over the place, all these dead ends, because like Joram van der Sloot, he can't believe what he says. So when he says he did this, we know he probably didn't do that. Probably something else happened, not that she was hit by a car accidentally. And this is how he get rid of her body. Oh, no, none of that is true, as with Joram van der Sloot. So then uh, Rothbone was taken back to the, the, the station, booked for murder. And let's see, the police found no damage done to the Lexus prototype, which poked a hole in his claim that it was an accident and he hit her with the car. And they collected at his house, they collected more than 100 firearms along with a, along with a pack con containing a cord and duct tape that could be used to bind another person. That's called a rape kit. Then another alarming development. Rathbun appeared to try to kill himself on custody with a razor from a shaving kit. In the cell on the wall, he had written in blood, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. Oh, sure. The shallow wounds, I <laughs> see how this works with a psychopath. The shallow wounds led investigators to believe that this was a tactic, not an actual sign of remorse. You know, again, this is, this is why you cannot believe a psychopath. They will play you and play you and play you and play you. At the hospital, they talked to him again. Uh, oh, you know, but this is fine. Then they talk, appealed to him. Let the family, the death family desperately wants to put her rest. Where is she? Again, they're appealing to his remorse. It doesn't have any. All right. But eventually he did. Actually, I don't know what actual deal they offered him personally. Um, accompanied by a right in a police helicopter, he directed the officials to where he buried Sobek in the, in the Angeles National Forest. So finally, her body was found. And what happened with her body, let's say? Interestingly enough, her body had been kind of cold and was preserved. No signs of being struck by a car. Ligature marks on her ankle, indicating she had been restrained. She had blunt force trauma to her head and has been asphyxiated. She was clearly sexually and violently assaulted. He was charged with sexual assault and first degree murder. And uh, although the defense team said, that he accidentally strangled her during consensual sex. Oh, my God. Uh, he was convicted, sentenced to life in prison. Thank God. But look at the story. Look at that story. 
this is why you can't believe you're on van der Sloot. This is what everybody should understand how a psychopath will lie and lie and lie. Lie constantly. And his defense team will lie for him. The scumbags. Oh, a consensual sex. Yeah, sure. She goes for a job. She ends up in the desert, tied up, strangled. But no, that's consensual sex. And I'm sure each step of the way, the only reason he gave up any information was because it had something in it for him. Now, he may have he may have miscalculated. If you're a really good investigator, uh, prosecution team, you can cleverly trick somebody into giving information up that they would normally not do because they think they're getting something out of it. So I don't know what they did to get any information from this guy. But what did they get out of your own vanish slope? More lies. That's all. More lies. And, then, and your own Brown Slope won the day. So, but I thought that was a fascinating case for that reason. I was like, wow. Oh, Lord. Um, well, you know, uh, yeah, lots of aspiring models fall for that and end up getting killed. Unfortunately, um, people trying to get in the modeling industry, of course, they're pretty and they do attract attention. Um, and they will go to job after job interview after job interview with God knows who. Um, there's a lot of casting couch involved, photographers involved. Anybody can say anything and their the hope is that they're going to make it this time. And if they just accept this job or whatever, they might get, might have that opportunity. And on the other hand, a lot, some of these models or aspiring models are actually involved in prostitution because unless you are a real model and you've made it or you've made it in acting, like you actually are in the actor's union and earning a living, it's very hard to earn a living. And the problem is when you want to go to, um, uh, you, you, you're going to, let's say, you, you know, this, uh, you know, you're going to go for an audition. Well, if the audition is in the middle of the day, how are you going to keep a job? So it's very hard to do auditions and go get all this stuff and keep a job. So that's why a lot of times prostitution plays into it because prostitution is easier to do in little small segments of hours. So that's why some act, want to be actresses and want to be models are involved in prostitution. And that's simply a fact again, which people don't like to examine. Uh, I don't have any clue who that is. Um, everybody, um, I will take a quick picture of uh, whoever that is. Chloe, Chloe Ailing. I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard of that one. One of the greatest things that, um, oh, really? Uh, the photographer had made crappy comments to other models about Linda. I think they tried to warn her about him. Mm. And okay. One thing, uh, thank you all for bringing me all the, com the, the, the cases that you do, because I certainly don't know most of them. I mean, I'm a profiler, but it doesn't mean I'm up on all the cases. So with a large group of people, uh, I get get these cases, which I've never even heard of. As far as being a photographer, that's used by a lot of serial killers because all you have to do is you go, you go down. Once upon a time, there was a thing called Kinko's. <laughs> if you remember that, Kinko's, um, which was a print shop for cheap. And you go down there and you print up a bunch of cards that say, hi, my name is, and your name, and then it says photographer models, actresses, maybe a picture of a camera. And you go to a bar and you pull that out or you meet a girl on the street and you pull it out. And once they see a card that says photographer, they get so freaking excited. Or they can have, let's say, scout, a, a scouting for a modeling agents, a model scout, whatever they're going to put on that card. Girls go berserk, berserk on that because it's like this dream come true, something you never could have imagined. Oh, my God, I'm going to be in Hollywood. I'm going to be a model. Oh, my God. And they fall for it. So is it because of the card? Something about printed stuff makes people believe stuff more than just you saying something because it's in print. Now we don't have printed cards much anymore. We have the Internet. So people go to the website that was completely fake. <laughs> and they go to the website and the guy says, I'm a photographer. And they go, oh my God, look, he's got pictures on there that he stole from other photographers. And they fall for this stuff. And so just because something is, you can visually see something doesn't mean it's true. And that's again, very, very important. Oh, she, she said she was kidnapped going for a modeling job. Interesting. I'm going to look that one up. That's interesting. Oh, this is true. Uh, what about watch about photographers approaching girls at the mall? Yes. And of course, in other countries where they're saying that that's how children get pulled into sex trafficking, mostly not so much sex trafficking. A lot of times it's just work trafficking. But, you know, you got, again, poor, poor, poorer people and they get this opportunity. They show up in town and say, hey, come on. Anything can happen because you just don't know. Even if they set up shop someplace, just because you go there doesn't mean they're going to be there tomorrow. 
So you got to be really careful of all that crap. But I thought that was a fascinating case in that sense that, wow, you know, it's, it, it points out so many of those issues um, about how, how psychopaths work and, and how they tell their stupid stories. Um, let's see. Um, what else I want to talk about? Uh, uh, somebody asked me about the, the Patron. I, I, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but Patron. Uh, Richard, Richard Patron, Patrone, depending on how it's said, and Danielle Imbo. They disappeared on 2005 in a very strange case. Uh, is this them? Yeah. Uh, this is Danielle and Richard. Um, he was single and had a kid. She was divorced or separated and had a kid. And they hooked up and they went out one night to met, had a bar, went to a bar. They were out hanging out with friends, having a great time. And then they leave and he's supposed to be taking her home. That's what he told them. He's going to take her home. And nobody ever saw them ever after. And so their vehicle, which was a big SUV, was an SUV. Let me see. Because this what they were looking for it. Um, that's that's what the vehicle looked like. Because this is a case of the people with adventures with a purpose have searched all the riverways uh, all over the place um here. Uh and this is um he lived in she lived in, I think she lived in Jersey and he lived in PA across the border. Let's see. Um he lived in uh he lived in South Philly. Uh, she lived in South Jersey and he's going to drop her off across the river and, um, and they were never seen again. The cell phones, their financial records went dead. Their black 2001 truck, the Dodge Dakota has never been seen again. And that was back in what, 2005? It's been 20 years. Anyway, the, the, the question on this case is this. Did they just drive off the road into the drink? And, and you know, one of the things is when, when they do these searches, it's amazing how many vehicles they actually pull out. When they're looking for one vehicle, they pull out 10. You know? um, a lot of vehicles end up there. Not, not all of them have people in them. Some of them are just dumped. But um, a lot of times when people vanish, just vanish off the face of the earth and their vehicle vanishes off the face of the earth, most of the time they drove off the road into the water someplace and they sink. And the problem is if there's enough water in the area, like huge rivers and, and lakes and lots of bridges going over wherever, sometimes it's very hard to know where they would have even gone into the water. So chances are because no one can come up with a really good reason why anybody will want to do these to harm. Uh, some say her, her, her husband want to get rid of her, you know, cause they, I guess, maybe uh, child support payments. And the other guy, somebody said, well, maybe he gambles too much. But nobody could come up with anything really good. But this is what's interesting. And this fascinates me that they're saying this. Um, they are saying now, this is, this is the FBI. Authorities have pursued hundreds of leads and listened to thousands of tip calls. Searches were conducted on the ground, ground and by air, and the wa air, waterways were combed. The nature of the crime has led investigators to conclude it was a planned attack acted out by more than one person. We feel this is an orchestrated act. A 3,000 pound truck and two people do not simply go missing. Um, uh, okay. I got some problems with that comment. First of all, I don't see they have any basis for it. And that bothers me because, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to say something, could you at least come up with some, something rational, but their idea is that it couldn't happen, but it has happened before. There's been vehicles and people gone missing before when they go into the water. Now, the alternative to this is that it's a hit of some sort mob hit, but they, they don't have any connections to anybody there with any reason to be killing these people. And now they went to a bar so if they were killed by some kind of hit, some kind of somebody had to literally be waiting outside the bar for them. But, you know, generally speaking, getting rid of the vehicle is not something you want to waste time with. You might as well just shoot them when they come out of the bar, stab them, look like a street robbery. Uh, or if you're going to knock the car off the road, look, make it, you don't have to take the vehicle. What the hell? Why do you have to do that? It's a lot of work to get rid of the vehicle. So essentially what they're saying is that somebody had to follow them 
somehow get them off the road or follow them all the way like to her house because that's where you're supposed to be dropping her off. So they get to her house and they all come around the vehicle with guns. Then they take the two of them and then somebody drives off the other vehicle. So they had, that's what they're saying. Had to be more than one person because you have to have two vehicles, right? Somebody to drive one, somebody to drive the one that came in. So now you've got the two vehicles taking off. The two people are killed and dumped someplace and then they have to get rid of the vehicle. Well, They've, they've checked all the waterways. So what does that mean? Is that vehicle, was it taken to some kind of junkyard and crushed? What, what happened to it? And why did they go to all that work? Well, it seems to be no particularly good reason. So, you know, can, can I figure out what happened? No, because unless I've got a reason to believe anybody would go to this work to kill one of them or the other, I just, both of them, I just, and get rid of the vehicle. That's I've, I've seen a lot of hits. They you know hire some cheapo dude to do something. They're not going to go to do all that work. You know, they're not. Um, so wh why would somebody do all of this? And if you if somebody didn't pay you your stuff, the last thing you want to do is kill them because you don't get your money. So what is the purpose of this crime supposedly? And I I can't come up with any. Um, so maybe if I were working on the case and I had access to all the files, I could find out all the backgrounds. But supposedly out to the public, all we know is this guy who's not, you know, nothing big, you know, his normal life, she has a normal life, they meet up with their friends, have some drinks, they're both going home to take care of their kids, and they disappear, and the vehicle disappears, but it's a what, mob hit? Or some kind of hit for hire? You know, somebody, I, just, I can't come up with anything on it, because uh, it makes very little sense to me. Um, uh, but... I, again, I'm, I'm not behind the scenes. I can't see what they, they see, but I just find it as a kind of a strange story that the, the FBI put out. Um, maybe they really don't know, you know, maybe they think, well, they may have just driven into the water someplace. We just didn't find the stupid vehicle. But just in case it wasn't that, let's just put this out in public and see what we get back. I don't know. But you would think if they studied the histories of all these people, they, these two people, they knew their relatives, they knew their friends, they knew what issues were on in their life. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a strange, it's a strange story that doesn't seem to have a lot of information coming from law enforcement that makes any sense. So, but speaking of somebody hiring somebody here, here's a, just, I, this is just a great example. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, it's this guy. See this guy here. This is Jeffrey Arista. He's one of two brothers charged in a three men abduction plot in which the suspected conspirators allegedly snatched the wrong man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're going to hire a hitman, <laughs> you want to make sure they get rid of the vehicle and the two people. You want to have it done well, you see. You don't want to hire these guys. So so what happened with these guys? Now, I say it looks like Colombian cartel stuff, but they're pretty bad Colombian, like cartel kidnappers, but really bad. So what they did was they used a Florida Airbnb. So they rented an Airbnb. They had fake badges and police lights. They abducted the wrong guy and waterboarded him at the Airbnb. That's, okay, so what they did was this. Three men are accused of abducting a Florida man in Fort Lauderdale at gunpoint, waterboarding him, and then trying to enlist his help in their plot when they realized they had taken the wrong person. <laughs> the alleged victim played along until he got away long enough to call in a bomb threat that sent in a massive police response, and they all got caught. Hey, that guy, that guy thought it out. So what they did was they allegedly, no, it's not alleged, they did, snatch a man in a parking lot garage outside his Fort Lauderdale home. They're wearing fake badges and forced him into the back of a Dodge Charger with police lights, or police style lights. All right, then what did they do? The plot fell apart when they realized the person they abducted wasn't the one they had been hired to take. The whole mess is a, quote, typical of Colombian cartel activity, which I will just point out. There's a reason we don't want the cartel coming across our borders and setting up shop all over the country, which they are all over the country in the U.S. already. If you ever look at the stuff that the cartel activities in Mexico and in Colombia, what those people locally in those countries, the good people of those countries have to suffer because of that. Go back to the Pablo Escobar days in Colombia. Thank God he's gone. And this, the country has improved dramatically. Even Medellin, which it was, was once cartel territory number one, you could actually go there now and it's a beautiful place. And, you know, people deserve to have a wonderful city and, and not fear, be in fear of their lives. But you let those people into your country and let them run amok, this is what you get. And, and a lot of these guys aren't that smart. So it's not like, 
it's not like everything they do is cleverly thought out and they're going to, no, they do dumb crap, you know? So anyway, it says the whole mess is a, is typical of Colombian cartel activity. According to a retired homicide detective who investigated the infamous cocaine cowboys, because well, you know, that makes you that expert. Okay. I just, I love these. I give you these, these one, one, one sentence statements out. It's not his fault. This is what the media does. They call you up and they ask you, they interview you for 20, 30 minutes. And then they take one line, chuck it in their, in their story. They usually talk to three people and take one line from each. And then whatever you said, isn't really what you said. And he said, you would think when they took out a hit, they'd hire a professional. They don't. It sounds more like he owed money. They hired some guys off the street who had no clue and boom, it's a case of Keystone cops could crack something. Okay. So then it says, um, so apparently what they did was the trio allegedly threw their abductor's phone out of a moving vehicle, but later gave him a new one <laughs> when they needed his help contacting their original target, their actual target. They bought, brought him to the Airbnb, allegedly threatened him with pistols, stun guns and electric drill before waterboarding him in the bathroom. They held him for about 12 hours before hatching the alleged plot to use him as bait for their intended target, who they discovered was one of his co-workers. Using the replacement phone, they learned the actual target was an unnamed business in Pompano Beach. Then they drove the abductee to there in a rented Porsche, and he went inside, warned the actual target, and called in the bomb threat, prompting a rapid police response. <laughs> oh, my God. What can you say? You know. Ah, uh, but in, in, in reality, uh, most hits done by somebody you pay five or $500, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, they're not that brilliant. Okay. So their, their, their methodology is not like super classy and super fancy, not like in a Hollywood movie, unless you're like working for a specific organization, you probably don't have that much talent. Um, and so that's why I think the other case of thinking they got rid of the vehicle and the did they really, they had some hit. Nobody knows why the hit happened, but they managed to get rid of two people in a big vehicle with, with not leaving a trace behind. So that was either some really great big organization or it, they just went, they just drove off the road into the water. So I will, I will lean toward that until proven otherwise. So, um, <laughs> uh, Michaela's here. Did you miss every, anything? Of course you did. <laughs> Uh, um, let's see. Oh, interesting you say that. Alyssa says El Salvador is safe now too, through all the gang bangers in jail. You're actually correct. Um, I've talked to a, a number of El Salvadorians and I just had a, my, my table tennis coach. He, he just went to El Salvador for a table tennis tournament. And uh, he said it was fabulous down there and they have cleaned it up tremendously and the capital is quite safe. So, you know, time goes on and things change. So El Salvador uh, right now, yes, is pretty safe down there. Uh, Colombia is pretty good right now. Uh, unfortunately, there's other countries which are uh, lovely countries which are getting, you know, getting worse. But always you gotta be careful when you, when you look at, if you just go look at, you know, like people, oh, don't go to Mexico. No, most of Mexico is great. So if you look at these things that say whether it's, you know, what, what level of danger it is. A lot of that's sort of nonsensical. Um, so you have to you have to understand where cartel territories are and where 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 regular people where people live and generally speaking, crime is as a you know as a visitor is not going to be a big deal, especially if you're not like buying drugs and stuff. Um, there's a lot of safe places in Mexico. I've been there many times, had a great time. Um, so, but you should do your do your investigations. Uh, <laughs> the hippos. Oh yes, uh, Pablo Escobar's hippos. They are running amok. Apparently, you know, he got those hippos because, you know, he, he could. And they've, they've, bre they've bred and there's a whole crap load of hippos running around there in Colombia. <laughs> They're on the wrong continent, but there they are. That's quite something. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so look at some of your other comments. Huh? Uh, oh, that's nice. The Salvadorians are very proud and happy right now. That's nice. I mean... You know, it's not it's nothing like you know, being being a citizen of a place where you're not doing anything wrong and you love your country, but your country has gone into a kind of a bad, bad state and, and you don't have power to do anything about it. And then people look at you and go, you're from, 
you're from Salvador. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm so I'm, I'm glad for them. That's really nice. That's really, really nice. Let's see if I have anything else to say before I, I quit for today. Uh -huh. um, let's see. <laughs> I'll mention this one. I thought it was funny. <laughs> and this may be true for this group because we got a lot more females here. But um, these women use true crime podcasts to lull themselves to sleep. Experts explain why it works. <laughs> so, you know, now, mind you, um, generally speaking, as, as, a, as a YouTuber, I like people to stay awake during my, my shows um, because I like to be teaching them something. But for advertising purposes, as long as you leave your, your computer on, that once you fall asleep, the advertisements keep coming and I get paid. So <laughs> And then if you fall asleep during the whole show, you can go back and watch it again. But anyway, what's the explanation for this? Um, so this woman's bedtime routine is pretty ordinary. She turns off the lights, gets comfortable in bed. But before she shuts her eyes, uh, she picks up her phone and presses play on her favorite true crime podcast. Of course, sometimes it helps when you don't have to look at the person. You know, you're listening to a podcast. Um, some people say, why don't you just do podcasts? And, you know, so it's audio. Um, eh. It's just not me. A lot of people like them. To, I, I find a lot of podcasts very slow and they bore me to death, which would make me fall asleep. I like a little bit more liveliness. I like to see expressions, as you know. Um, and I don't know. I just enjoy I enjoy video much, much more. And so I do what I like because otherwise I'm simply not going to do it. I don't need to make my life miserable. Um, let's see. So in any way, she says, uh, this woman, um, my friends think I'm crazy. So she, she re listens to things. She falls asleep. My friends think I'm crazy. They don't understand how I could fall asleep listening to a true crime podcast. It was some, it's never something that was scary to me. It was almost a sense of comfort, which is kind of, it's kind of a strange concept um, that, and you know, we got the issue of a murder and entertainment being put together, murdertainment. Um, that people are fascinated. And once upon a time, it was simply Agatha Christie it was a, was a, a fictionalized thing. But now it becomes to a point where true crime is so huge, people like to hear about real people being murdered. They do. They're fascinated by that. And it's kind of sick in a, in a way. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But it is. It's kind of unfortunate. Um, now, personally, myself, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not big on true crime. I've never been big on true crime. I'm, I'm Always the person. Now, some of you too are like me. You like the puzzle more than the emotions or the horror and all that kind of stuff. I like the puzzle, figuring things out. That's why I've always gone for the few fictional shows like Death in Paradise, where it's about the puzzle. It's about putting all the pieces together. I've always found that fascinating. Um, but I'm not interested in the gore or the terror or all this. That just that to me is like I'm not interested. But everybody's got their own thing. But as she says, it. Um, She's not alone. Sometime, spend some time on TikTok and you'll find that many women prefer to doze off to stories about stalking, cat kidnapping, and murder. True crime is a, a genre of entertainment that details the events of real crime, often quite salaciously. Historically, TV shows and movies that have been the primary way Americans consume true crime, but in the last decade, podcasts have become increasingly popular along, and, you know, along with YouTube, which is a version of podcasting. Um, so then they talk about the main, it says 34% of Americans listened to a podcast last year. Eh, that's not much of a, one podcast doesn't mean much. All right. Uh, that they find true crime calming and comforting. This is what I find kind of weird. Um, let's see what it says. Why would you find it? Women are more captivated. That's true. Um, and even though women are mostly the victims of these crimes too. So women are listening to other women being raped and murdered. That's interesting. So it's not like men are sick and going, I just love it when women are raped and murdered. You know, it's women going, oh my God, it could be me. Um, and that a lot of it's 34% uh, of the women, murder victims uh, that, are, that come across are intimate partners. I think for a lot of women, that's, you know, that's kind of just eye opening for them. They keep looking at their partner going, <laughs> should I go to sleep tonight? <laughs> to this true crime podcast <laughs> while you're on the other side of the bed. Might give you an idea. Um, so it puts it here's the con the content it's like ghost stories supposedly okay and they they never fail to lull this woman to sleep um some are nostalgic okay well, that's interesting um 
You, my grandma would be like, you could watch this with me, but keep in mind, this didn't even happen close to us. And the person is in jail, some kind of reassurance. But a lot of these are unsolved crimes. So I'm not sure how reassuring that is. Okay, my research shows that women, this is who's given this research, uh, Amanda Vickery, Associate Professor of Psychology at Illinois Wesleyan University. My research shows that women like true crime because they can learn something from it. They can learn how not to be killed. I'm good with that. They, learn, they like true content where they learn the signs to watch for in a killer. I'm okay with that. Or they learn what they can do if they're kidnapped, which is pretty much most of the time nothing, just... The few people that survive will always come up with a reason. They're the ones that survive. Um, uh, uh, by learning how people end up victim, they can keep themselves that from happening to them. I think that's that's the best part of it, in my opinion, an educational version of that. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. So how many of you go to sleep to True Crime podcasts? Now, I know my sister falls asleep when she listens to me, but... She uses me just as a sleeping pill. <laughs> you know? I don't know if she ever makes it through the hangouts, but she, she likes listening to me for like 10 minutes. And she, you know. um, let's see. Uh, that, that's a good point. A disassociation. Uh, disassociate and pretend they're listening to a horror story. Almost like bedtime stories. I, I suppose. It's just not. It's odd because for me, that's just. No, I'm not really into that. I want something. I don't find true crime soothing. I want something that, well, okay. Do I watch the cartel movies before I go to sleep? Okay, maybe I do. <laughs> oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Ah, Alyssa says uh, cooking videos. And I do like the art videos where they do the, the different pours and then they go like this. Oh, hello. Hold on a second. Hello. It's my. I think it's my granddaughter. What? Is that you, Annabelle? I do. Can you leave? Because I'm on. I'm on. I'm on the show. Can you say hi to everybody? Hi. <laughs> she said hi. Yes, I would. Are you doing it now? Um, probably. We have forty pumpkins. So. What? Forty pumpkins? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go tell you with your mom. Uh -huh. Who else is there? No. Just you and your mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, tell your mom I'm on my way. I'm just gonna finish up my show and I'm gonna come. Okay. Yeah. Bye. bye. <laughs> well then, as you can see, this is a live show with no editing. <laughs> oh my goodness, there she is. That's my <laughs> you better go. I gotta paint pumpkins. Yeah. You see, I do that because it's comforting, you know. I'll maybe I can take Joran van der Sloot, kick him out of my head. And go <laughs> and go enjoy Halloween stuff with my granddaughter. Isn't that nice? Okay, so that's it, guys. I'm gonna I have a couple more things, but I'll save them for next week. Um, any more ideas for the show this weekend? I'm still ruminating over that because we were on Vanda Sloat, like took up three days of my life and 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 took my mind away from my future show. So send anything over. You say, Pat, I've asked you to do this like 10 times now. You've never done it. <laughs> so, so do let so do let me know. And I might try to do that. So goodbye to everybody that's here. Uh, thank you for being here. It's been a fun, it's been a fun day in spite of Van der Sleece. And um, okay, I'm gonna go go paint pumpkins. If you're new to the channel, like and subscribe so I can survive. Bye. <laughs>